The Archie Sonic the Hedgehog comics are a curious case. Despite being based on the Sat-A-M cartoon, its tone and story acted more like a comedic reflection of it, and it wasn't very much like the games until far into the comic's lifespan. It wasn't the most popular comic series starring the Blue Blur, in Sega's eyes anyway, but no matter the era, it was truly an influential and well-remembered piece of Sonic media where a lot of really talented creators got their stride. Many artists and writers would become synonymous with great, well-written Sonic media. However, one could argue that it wasn't always smooth sailing. Sure, you have your Gallaghers and your Mannix, but these comics were also the cornerstone that gave a particular writer a chance to step into the spotlight. He bears a lot of what made early Archie Sonic content unique, both good and bad, but I'm not here to diss a former writer. Instead, I'm going to give an in-depth look at one of the most often forgotten pieces of Sonic media, the Knuckles the Echidna comic. Good day, all. Robotnik Holmes here. This video format is something pretty new to me. I've never once tried to make a whole retrospective. I'm more of a make an overview and regrettably linger on the subject type of reviewer. But I felt it's what this Knuckles spin-off deserves. It's just so full of weirdness, it's got a plethora of different topics, and I'd rather not stretch it across multiple videos. So I'm going to separate my overview into multiple categories. I'll try to keep the criticisms at a minimum, unless it's necessary. And if you like this content, don't be afraid to click subscribe and ring that bell thingy to keep up with my semi-regular content. So without further ado, let's begin the retrospective. Where to start? How about the beginning? <laughs> that's, that's the best place to start. Former writer Ken is an American artist and writer, best known for his work on the Archie Sonic comics, but he's also done inks and lettering for a few other properties, uh, such as Star Trek The Next Generation. It doesn't look that bad with human characters, actually. Nowadays, since his departure from Sonic Comics in 2006, he mainly does commission work, unabashedly shares his political views online, repeatedly criticises any new Sonic media that comes out, and even commits the cardinal sin of offending just about every minority that exists. He's been latching his unreleased independent graphic novel onto popular trends ever since to stay relevant, uh, all of it vaguely based on the echidna cart he created many decades prior. And speaking of echidnas, you can say that he's always had a kind of fondness for Knuckles, considering that he was the character he focused on the most even back in his first year of writing. I totally understand the jokes and memes regarding Ken's obsession for Knuckles the extremely marketable echidna, but for the following years, that was pretty much the only thing Ken did, write about Knuckles, and give him a bloodline of grumpy, ever-present grandfathers. Uh, no, screw it, make a whole city of Knuckleses. While other writers like Bollers and Gallagher and co continued the general story, Ken seemed resigned to just constantly churn out needless lore and very underwhelming side stories that no reader would ever remember. Then he got into a spat with the editors for not being, you know, a Sonic writer, and he left the comic and took all his characters with him, uh, before suing Archie Comics for still using his characters, among other things. Nowadays he's making these really off-putting graphic novels- oh, sorry, an idea of a graphic novel that hasn't taken off even a decade after its announcement. It's for the best, I'm most certain. His third grand project during his tenure on Archie Sonic, uh, after the flop that was the Princess Sally miniseries and the slightly above average Endgame saga, was the Knuckles the Echidna side comic, a passion project that lasted 32 issues and seems to be a hodgepodge of semi-political themes and 80s sci-fi influences, uh, mostly Star Trek and DC's Superman, with our red boy Knuckles placed smack dab in the middle. You thought the Echidna was overshadowed by themes and narrative in his own miniseries? My good bugger, you should see him in this one. When this book first got published, it was referred to as Knuckles the Dark Legion, uh, following the events of the miniseries, but continued as an ongoing comic in its own right thanks to its surprise popularity. Yeah, in the early 90s, content involving Knuckles and his bloodline were considered vastly superior to the mainline Sonic comics at the time. No doubt for its entirely different tone, mostly consistent art direction, and profound narrative that really set itself apart from the goofy adventures of a blue hedgehog. All of which I totally understand. 
If I was a kid reading comics like this, and then seeing something new that looks like this, I'd probably latch onto the cooler one too. But as the years went on, uh, it's... <laughs> it doesn't hold up anymore. It certainly feels like this spin-off has only decreased in popularity, with our main echidna being the single most important element, and yet he feels like the only one that got the short end of the stick. But before talking about Knuckles' limited involvement in his own side comic, I should probably give an evaluation on the overarching stories first. If there is one consistent element of this book, it's that the narrative firmly roots itself on Angel Island, its politics, and its lengthy history, with Rad Red over here acting as both the leading hero of the comic and the audience surrogate. He learns about all these organisations and new faces just as quickly as we do, which does a lot to make him relatable, even if it could just be chalked up to him being a blank slate for most of it. Before this comic was published, uh, Knuckles and his ragtag team of random dudes, the Chaotix, were just kind of hanging out on Angel Island, a landmass that floats thanks to a large Chaos Emerald, and barring a couple of trap-filled tunnels and a giant mountain that looks like a skull-shaped phallic symbol, the place didn't have that many other features except for its Mobian wildlife. Boy, does that change in this spin-off comic. A great number of things make themselves known to our hero on this floating rock. <laughs> Not only do many different factions of Echidnas appear out of nowhere due to hazy sci-fi reasons, ironically making Knuckles' title as the last of his kind redundant, but there's this secret acorn organisation situated in the mountains, the dingoes have went from being a herd of animalistic doofs to whatever allegory the narrative wants them to be, and there's even a human overlander dude who hunts animals and Mobians for sport. All of this never being found out by Knuckles, the one who we assume to know the ins and outs of the island. I'm sure the writer didn't want anyone to think about that too much, or else we'd get brain freeze. Despite being a serious side comic about serious matters, it is still based on a children's property, so like the mainline Sonic comic, it's never afraid of dipping into the cartoonish absurdity, though here it may very well clash with the before-mentioned seriousness, such as Vector here using his blaring music to divert a wildfire, Jeffrey's Secret Service group has a lot of unfunny banter that takes away any nuance of their whole espionage mission. And what's up with the Chaotix knocking down a tree to block the way of a bunch of familiar NPCs? It's not to save them, and they seem to see the crowd as just as much of a problem as the previously mentioned forest fire. This comic's action can be extremely senseless like that, and it really becomes a disservice to the stories that they're trying to tell. I love me a good sci-fi flick, but I don't feel these themes are handled very well at certain points of this comic. It may be because of my lack of knowledge, but I'm pretty sure cities don't phase in and out of existence for no discernible reason, nor survive after being supposedly blown up in its backstory. And most of the stuff involving Ray the Flying Squirrel is trapped in this little alternate dimension chamber with a gem that keeps him alive thanks to suspended animation? There's explanations for some of these things, but to my understanding, all it does is bloat the entire story with tiresome speech bubbles. There is a lot of talking in this side comic. It's overwhelming, and not helped by the writer's habit of capitalising every other word and having near every sentence end in an exclamation mark. There's very little moments where the narrative just slows down. The only ones I see being when Julie Sue discusses relationships with Laura Lur, and when Knuckles sits down and talks serious with Sally in a throwback issue. The story going loudly all in can be a tiring experience for most, and its action and sci-fi can be easily glazed over by the average reader. The whole thing is just synonymously confusing and tiring. In terms of narrative, thankfully it's sorted into arcs that are typically a four-issue structure, with a majority of covers fitting together to make a full picture. It's honestly rather ambitious, and it helps give this side comic a sense of identity. But even these vary in quality. You have some really decent ones, like the Dark Legion one, and the one of Enerjack menacingly spanning across three whole covers, grabbing at different characters in each one. But then there's the Dark Alliance and the Poacher arc, and it's clear that the comic artists weren't given much instruction. Another thing the narrative does constantly is show past events in flashback form with a brown tinted filter, and these can go from one or two pages to practically half of the issue. It's pretty crazy, and not all of it really helps the story. As some issues are a generally decent read, save for some of its unsatisfactory art direction, and some are things that I wish to never read again. I'll give a short overview of each of the story arcs, but forgive me if I skim over any relevant plot details. 
Knuckles and co. meet and confront a legion of cybernetically enhanced echidnas, including their current leader, Kragok. Knuckles meets Julie Sue, another legionnaire, and they stop a dingo uprising in Echidnaropolis, which now exists. Enerjack returns after being sent into space in the miniseries, only to be put into his place by Mammoth Mogul in a drawn-out climax. Knuckles meets Aver and Robin the Hedgehog and becomes Jesus for a second. The Chaotix get food poisoning after taking LSD-related drugs, and no I'm not kidding, leading to Julie Sue having to beat up the mobsters responsible. Knuckles has conflict with his parents, who he realises are still alive, with emotional emphasis on him reuniting with his deadbeat dad, curiously enough. I'll get to that later. Uh, a Guardian appears in the middle of Julie Sue bonding with Knuckles' mum, and then leaves one issue later in a scuffle with Kragok. Prince Alias, seemingly Sally Acorn but cooler, makes his debut, and Queen Alicia is found in cryogenic stasis, uh, found thanks to Jeffrey's Secret Service group. There's a somewhat effective plot point with a Dark Legion leader having infiltrated the good guys, and he is unaware that Knuckles knows of his identity. <laughs> I rather liked that tense scene. There's a general election held, in which the bad guys lobotomise one of the participants and pits him against a Nazi echidna robot in hopes of ruling Angel Island legally. Holy crap. Knuckles has issues with his mum Larilla's new husband. He and Julie Sue start going on a date and end in the worst comic panel ever printed. Seriously, you'll have a harder time guessing what isn't wrong with this page. Uh, Sally Acorn reunites with Knuckles and they talk about their pasts together and how distant they've become. And finally, Knuckles and a childhood bully team up to face off against a poacher, uh, aptly named Hunter, and that's where this side comic ends. Quite a weird bit to end on, though I'm willing to bet it was due to poor sales, or lack of interest. No wonder Archie Comics chose to can this whole side comic. There's an overarching theme of family, destiny, and unquestioning loyalty to your superiors. Fitting, considering this is Knuckles' home. This comic has an obsession with family trees and naming every individual male echidna. In the good guy camp, we have the Brotherhood of Guardians, a long line of grandfathers that have the eyebrow-raising tradition of raising their sons on the floating rock and then pretending to off themselves in a great wall of fire, only to secretly watch them from afar in their safe haven. The last point is actually a thing you see with regular frequency in this writer's works. You can make a drinking game on how often you see old guys watching the good guys' heroics on television and a spouting foreboding narration. The Brotherhood are all users of the Chaos Force and rule over their city, often conflicting with their sworn enemies, the Dark Legion. These hooded dudes that embrace technology in all forms and even graft the stuff onto their bodies. The comic goes into both groups' histories for unapologetic lengths of time and, while neat on a surface level, and neither group are particularly interesting. They fit a little too neatly into their designated hero and villain spots, and barely have an ounce of personality. It's very hard to differentiate themselves from one another except by character designs. It's easy to check yourself out with the Brotherhood. They are very morally grey in that while they are protectors of Echidneropolis, they have very questionable ways on which they treat the lower class and citizens in general. They feel like mothers and daughters in the family have no part in learning to be a guardian, a sexist mindset that wouldn't be disputed until 25 years later in-universe with the inclusion of Lara Sue. They didn't think Dr. Robotnik, a dictator who conquered most of the world and even threatened the floating island multiple times, was a cause for concern and they were only willing to help the heroes if it resorted to using nuclear missiles. Yes, they legit said that. And they are so blindly obedient to the ways of the Brotherhood that when they see a kid bully a young Knuckles when he's trying to learn, they wait till nightfall and toss the boy off the island to his supposed death. I don't think it's right to refer to them as heroes in this side comic. Do these look like heroes to you? The Dark Legion are no better, but they are certainly more interesting for their villainous aesthetics. The Legionnaires in particular have an almost endearingly cute look to them, and from time to time they provide some slightly goofy antics in the background. The organisation splintered off from the Brotherhood long ago due to the Council banning technology, and the Dark Legion felt that they would still need that technology for their daily life, so they did the natural thing and attempt to overthrow throw the government. What? They announced themselves as the future of Echidna kind before being banished to another dimension. It seems that Echidna society forgot about the Brotherhood's ban on technology, as both parties use televisions and high-tech gadgets and whatnot, so again, it's best not to read too much into the backstory no matter how extensive. 
The Legionnaires act as typical goons for Knuckles to beat up, who are all the same height and size as Knuckles, which makes for a humorous and slightly self-depreciating gag on one panel. But they are apparently dense enough to overlook the Chaotix when they wear dark cloaks over their snouts and tails. I guess they allow annoying crocodiles into their ranks now. They've also got a tiring history that's not much to write home about. They've had a long line of Grand Masters, from Menaka, its extremist founder, to Kragok, this guy, who I swear is only interesting for his design alone. The more important members of the group are arguably series mainstays Dimitri, a Grand Master who becomes more and more of a deteriorated cyborg as the series goes on, and Leanda, a ruthless echidna girl decked out in leather. These characters get more fleshed out as the comic goes on, and I think that's a testament to how popular they were in this side comic, even if they were simply typical monologuing villains here. Especially in the case of Dimitri, his evil ramblings could give Mammoth Mogul a run for his money. Other than the two sides of Echidna kind, there are a couple of side characters who deserve special mention. First off, Julie Sue, Knuckles' love interest, first appears in this book. Initially seen as an untrustworthy bad guy, but she slowly grows into a badass with a laser gun. The way she's written isn't great, as she only really acts as a satellite to the main hero, and her portrayal as a female character in an action setting certainly raises some eyebrows. I'm super glad we've evolved from this portrayal of female characters, love interest or otherwise. Yes, Knuckles, the person trying to kill you is indeed a girl, so by all means, act a surprise for the 90s readers. And while you're at it, have this event play out multiple times in flashbacks because apparently it's just so important for the character. My stance on Julie Sue is that she makes for a decent sidekick to the red guy. She has some of Sally's action girl traits, but is never one to pull her punches, and she proves to be the most competent member of the main cast, even among the Chaotix. Speaking of which, the team of Mobians are still frequently kidnapped and serve as comic relief, even in settings when it doesn't call for it, like when they muck about in the hospital, or whenever Vector opens his goddamn mouth. Nobody likes Vector, and he often gets the ire of Knuckles and others due to how annoying and confrontative he can be. Their occupation as detectives weren't invented yet, so they don't get to do much except sit around in cafes and provide pages of cringeworthy banter. But each of them have some stakes in the plot, depending on the story. Charmy B gets a whole arc involving his regal upbringing and having a friend appear just to have the comic do a drug PTSA. Mighty goes on an unappealing adventure with Ray the Flying Squirrel, and also Fiona Fox and Nick are there. Espio has a side story where he and Liza, uh, this cute pink chameleon, confront his roboticized mentor, Valdez, and Vector uh, teaches Knuckles how to flirt with women in some very uncomfortable pages. Each of them have something to do, at least. Other characters to note who don't appear nearly as much are a Constable Remington, one of the only echidnas who doesn't look like Knuckles and is more of a Commissioner Gordon type, uh, Harry the Cab Driver, a dingo who seemingly only exists to give our heroes rise to the plot and is the butt of many unnecessary slapstick jokes, um, of the Brotherhood of Guardians, a Spectre, the only one with a personality, even if that personality is hatred. And Robbo the Hedge, <laughs> he doesn't hang around for very long, but I love his design and concept, and I like him and Marianne being a hedgehog and a kidna couple. The rest, like Enerjack and Hunter, I won't give much attention, as they are mainly confined to their arcs and don't have any traits whatsoever except for how blandly villainous they are. On that subject, there is one hero I feel I should really get into. He's not stated to be villainous in any way, or even an anti-hero, which I find extremely paradoxical concerning his utterly heinous actions and how he treats everyone, but I know there's more to this character than what's printed here. Let's talk about Locke. I'm just gonna put this here. I will go into the things that make Knuckles' dad a totally unlikable character, and I feel like this might hit a few sore spots, so skip to this timestamp if ever you feel uncomfortable. I'm gonna be calling this old man out for quite a while. So as many, many issues have built up towards, Knuckles' dad is shown to still be alive and continues to watch over his son from computer monitors hacking into things so that he can save him from certain death a number of times. We get more of him sitting around in his haven, but in one issue, he finally gets caught in mid-escape, or maybe he was hoping to be caught, and then the issue quickly turns the deadbeat dad meeting into a happy reunion. The tonal shift is so jarring you get whiplash just reading it. 
I've complained about it before, but Knuckles quickly forgiving Locke for lying to him and leaving him in the wilderness for roughly a decade for the greater good is twisted as heck. No father would ever do this if they loved their son, and the comic never refers to this as a bad thing. Locke is back in the red guy's life, and now they're acting like he never left at all. Like, no, no, I don't buy that. Because, like, you're telling me Rad Red never felt nothing? He had no emotions at all when he met his super caring mum again, but when the guy who abandoned him as a child gets cornered, suddenly all the emotions come in? Knuckles should be feeling bitter about being psychologically and emotionally abused and manipulated like that. There's no way this error went over the writer's head. And this isn't the only reason the character is dislikable, there's also the way he treats Larilla. Both in flashbacks where he reinforces the Brotherhood's obsession with raising sons on their own and seeing the wives as glorified baby makers, and in the present day where he kisses her without consent when they're trapped in the snow. They are separated and she's with someone else by the by. It, it's not the romantic beat the writer thinks it is. Another thing regarding the way he treats both Knuckles and Lorela is how he once experienced a nightmare of a dead-end plot point, woke up, and then was like, yeah, better prepare my son for the coming days by bathing his egg in Chaos Emerald energy because Mobians can lay those now. It's such an unorthodox thing for a heroic character to do, and very much deserves all the memes made out of it to criticise Locke and his skewed motivations. <laughs> Anything that brings the Sonic community together is to be commended. It is known that the writer made Locke as a way of working out his issues with his own father, and even got a story in his memory involving Locke dying in a future timeline. I'm unsure if Knuckles' relationship with Locke parallels that of the writers with his own dad. <laughs> I shudder to imagine, considering how he never sees Locke's actions as negative traits. It's not fair to riff on the guy for possibly having an abusive father and channeling that into a kind of caricature of which the story twists to justify his abandonment, but the writer really should have listened to feedback and toned down his jerk-ass tendencies and give him and the other grandpas a single ounce of personality other than being obsessed with the greater good. Read the room, Kenneth. Oops, I guess I went full critic. Other than Knuckles' dad microwaving the baby because he had a bad dream, the other element of this comic is its shoehorning of real-life influences in its cast of fluffy animals. Mobians aren't often a mirror of real-life themes, at least they weren't in the cartoon, but the comic started making Robians like an oppressed group who were often racially mocked, and the already Native American coded wolf pack became a tribe wishing to find their homeland, interestingly both done under the same writer. But leave it to Ken to go full out on racial and political themes in this comic book made for children. And if you need an idea on how distastefully Ken uses such themes, check out the frontispiece for issue 22. It is a plagiarised version of a poem written by Martin Nimolla, a written piece about the purge of German civilians during Nazi occupation. It is absolutely shameless that the writer not only felt this appropriate for a sodding Sonic comic book, but also this is an insult to the original poet. And no joke, on Twitter, Ken used the argument, uh, I've got Jewish friends, guys. He says it wasn't bad. I really draw the line here. I raised an eyebrow at the dull character writing and corny evil counterparts taken straight, cringed at the obtuse usage of the action girl trope in both Sally and Julie Sue, damn near trembled at how abusive parents and sexist societies could be considered A-OK -okay by an ignorant populace and just as uncaring male-only organisation. But literally plagiarising a poem describing real horrors that happen to real people just for a vaguely profound and heart-hitting first page of a comic book about a red echidna with boxing gloves? It's just so very tone-deaf. And the shallow Nazi parallels don't end there. The Dark Legion are more of a typical evil army type, but at one point they are portrayed as both a Nazi group, complete with a variation of their salute, and a kind of right-wing party that wishes to rig an election? Yeah, that's... The writer just can't help himself. But wait, what's that over there? Enhance! Krusty Krab is unfair! Mr. Krab is in there! For whatever reason, the Dingoes are both the downtrodden working class of Echidneropolis and also a reference to the Nazi party. Yep, we get two allegories for the price of one. Like with the character of Locke, it makes it hard to see them in a legitimised grey area when they're only portrayed as two-dimensional. 
their leader, uh, General Helmut von Stryker, or Stryker for short, is yet another typical bad guy for Knuckles to fight, but he's also an army leader who fights for Dingo rights, even if in a threatening way, but we never get to see much of the latter. He and his troops are also drawn pretty weirdly, not to knock on the art, but who thought it was a good idea to base their faces off of Scooby-Doo? Was it the artist's decision? Oh, get a load of that segue. This comic has a fair number of artists, each on a sliding scale of genuinely decent and fricking abysmal. For issues 1 through 21, number 25 and most of the comic's covers, there's Galen's penciling, which is relatively decent and I don't have many complaints. It makes for a nice constant art style and it helps give this side comic its own visual identity. Galen can pull off great action panels and I always appreciate a good splash page every now and then. Even if sometimes his use of expressions can be either confusing or really weird, get a load of knuckles in these two panels. But someone tell Galen that it's totally okay to use repeating panels for the relatively slow moments, but not to the extent that it looks stupid as heck with forced zoom. To be frank, the other artists do this too, and it's just as weird there. This is a problem because it's just so distracting. Not to mention this entire page is just the one panel, but repeated like six times. No change in character posture, lighting, facial expressions, nothing. It really comes off as lazy, and I'm surprised this came from a professional comic artist. <laughs> this guy also gave us the Mighty Lips meme, completely unintentionally of course. Look at them lips! The second artist is Valentino of Image Comics fame, penciling issues 22 to 24. His work on the book isn't that appealing, probably because Mobians are just that much harder to draw than humans and typical superheroes. Not a fan, though the art he provided for Sally's Ascension story still stands out as delightfully surreal, for as much crap as that story gets for its statement that King Max's will is law. His art is weird, but it's alright when he's given the right story to illustrate. However, Valentino can't even compare to Alan's, an artist of which who is best known for his work on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and to be frank, it really shows in his art. The characters have many odd details under this guy, which doesn't rob from the chill downtime moments. He did do art of the first date story, but every other page can be unpleasant to look at with many instances of the characters appearing off-model and wonky. It's like instead of getting character references or game assets, the artist just used Galen's art as a reference. It does appear like a gross reflection of the artist's work at times. Not to mention, it gave us this panel. Great buggering Christ, why is Knuckles so ripped? What's with the Chaotics and their faces? Why is Locke like that? What's with the design of the Swan Woman Vector brought as a date? It's extremely bad and I thoroughly enjoy torching it with fire. For the one issue regarding Knuckles meeting Princess Sally, Morwenny was brought back on to do the illustrations, and his is obviously the best looking art overall. I appreciate how he depicts the light drama as Knuckles and Sally reflect on their shared history, and it's weirdly unnerving seeing the Brotherhood of Guardians actually smile, especially Spectre. For the side stories of issues 30 to 32, Colleen Doran takes the role of penciler, and she's very prolific in the graphic novel scene, her most popular work being on Neil Gaiman's Sandman. However, I'm afraid her illustrations here fall into the same trappings as other popular comic artists, in that while the action panels are fairly well done, the Mobian characters look extremely off with exaggerated expressions, which also doesn't help with the tiresome writing. It also doesn't help that the most she has to work with are chameleons, who all have classic SBO's off-putting eyebrow lines. Lastly, for the final three issues, Ken himself has descended from his regal writer role to draw up the narrative he wishes to showcase, and his art is unequivocally the least impressive of the bunch. His design for Monk as a purple ape man is extremely bland, the backgrounds are all big sick, off-coloured foliage or warehouses, Muckles looks like an unemotional action figure, Hunter is a bland copy of Craven but with a big gun, and the action, when there are some, fall flat and never stick the landing. Knuckles' mysterious chaos powers play a part, but even they look extremely unimpressive. To this day, I cannot believe that this guy was allowed the artist role even towards the end of his tenure as writer. Why keep letting him churn out artwork this bad for so long? 
It wouldn't be until the early 2000s when fans started getting tired of this dude's contributions, which would only diminish in quality as time went on. His inking would become less clear, his characters would look more lifeless with wide open eyes, the backgrounds, dear god, Google Images really was Ken's best friend in this case. Look at all the stock images lazily slapped on the page. But as much as I'd enjoy ripping into the writer's later stuff, I really should be getting back on track. Time to collect my thoughts and go back to professionalism. Looking back, the Knuckles the Echidna comic book didn't leave much of an impact on the comic's legacy, even less so on the Sonic franchise as a whole. It touts serious themes and claims to be influenced by important events, but all I see are those same inspirations stolen wholesale with Sonic characters pasted over them, with a shallow as heck story to fill in the gaps. In my honest opinion, there is quite literally nothing you can find in this side comic that you can't enjoy in the mainline Sonic book. But you know, I'll give this book one legitimate compliment. The only good thing that came out of this self-contained writer's vision, arguably, was the Dark Legion, an underutilised villain organisation which wouldn't be implemented well until other writers like Flynn came along, where they and their various operatives became a tad more fleshed out. A nice change from the usual, though I'm still starstruck. The Dark Legion actually influenced a lot of this comic's villain roster. Yeah, think about that. Without this two-dimensional group of grim-dark proportions, we would never have gotten the various Dark Egg Legion factions, or even the popular egg bosses following the reboot. It's not in any way a compliment to Ken's concepts, but it is intriguing that the idea of cybernetic Mobians would linger in the comic for well over a decade later. Let's see, as for scores, if I were to rate each issue of this side comic, it'd be, uh... Yeah, that. Low ratings all around, although the first three are probably the least offensive. Check them out at your own risk, I am bloody serious. If you liked this sort of video where I collect all my ramblings in a retrospective style, uh, do let me know. I'm always eager for feedback and trying new things. You know, my auntie self would have loved to see these vintage comic books. He loves this sort of crap. I wonder how he'd rate them if he were here. And that is why I am giving the Knuckles the Echidna spin-off comic a 10 out of 10. It's held up superbly over the years, and it deserves to be on a shiny as f pedestal. A pedestal of utter s***. <laughs> See, lesser me? I can be satirical too, you know.